You know, we talk a lot about culture, we talk a lot about identity, but really what, what, what makes you sort of motivated, what creates an identity for all of us? You know, we all strive for, you know, self-respect. So, but how do we go about doing it? You know, there's a lot of successful people who, you know, really aspire to accomplish certain things they have goals and aspirations. They know exactly what they have to do to do it, and they go about every day with a positive attitude and a lot of positive mindset to try to accomplish those things. And when they get to it, you know, they usually have success because they're well prepared. And then a lot of other people need something bad to happen, um, need to get humiliated uh, before, you know, they really sort of respond uh, because their pride is hurt, their self-respect is hurt. And then they really respond and do well at things. And, you know, it's a life lesson for all of us um, to choose the first path. And that goes a long way in creating an identity, you know, as for you as a person, as well as for us as a team. And that's certainly what we're trying to strive for, you know, to finish this season, you know, to play in this game for what we want to accomplish, what we want to do, reestablish the identity that we want in Alabama football. And, you know, that's what we're going to you know, try to finish and do, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, how players choose to do that. So, you know, I told the players earlier in the week, I said, you know, nobody should be able to come to practice and watch practice and be able to know who we're playing this week. If you're really motivated to do things the right way and you want to go play well, regardless, then no, nobody would be able to come here and know that who we're playing. Uh, because it's how you go about your work, it's what you do, and uh, I think that's you know the culture that we're trying to create and what we're trying to get our players to understand and try to do. So, and they, you know, I think a lot of them do it well. Some of them are learning lessons on how to do it well. Start with Chase. Austin P has a defensive back named Trey Stover, whose father Nikita Stover was on your first two teams here. Is it a surreal feeling for you when you come across some second generation players who, whose fathers you coach? Yeah, but that started a long time ago. <laughs> I mean, I coach Mark Ingram's dad. Yeah, it is. And but it also <laughs> it also <laughs> makes me aware of how long I've been doing <laughs> But in a good way. In in a good way. Um so yeah, it does. But I actually didn't know that. You know, I knew the the name of the player, but I never made the association. Appreciate you telling me that. Just where to Jameer Gibbs and, and Eli Rickstein with their injuries coming out of the game? Well, we'll see. You know, we'll, they're kind of day to day in terms of how they're doing and what they're doing. And, you know, we'll, 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 we won't be able to make that determination until closer to the game. Come over here, Charlie. You talked about Kendrick Law a lot after the game, but how has that whole freshman class of receivers kind of made progress this season? You know, I think the freshman receivers. Um, are a very talented group, and I think there have been times when, you know, each one of them have made really, really good plays. Uh, I think the biggest thing is with young players is that consistency in performance. Uh, they're not used to the grind of, you know, this kind of competition over this long a period of time, and um, that's that comes with experience. It comes with maturity, uh, but I'm very encouraged by. You know, that entire, you know, class. I mean, Emmanuel Henderson has done really, really well, too. He's starting to really blossom on special teams. Uh, he knows what he's doing at receiver now. Uh, he's very explosive. Um, so, you know, and you've seen, you know, it's like all the other freshmen have played to some degree. A couple other guys that are talented guys like Aaron Anderson has been hurt. Uh, he's finally healthy, and you can see, you know, what his potential might be. Uh, but it's kind of late in the season to try to, you know, get these guys, you know, involved in what's happening. Uh, but I'm very encouraged about that group. We'll step here with Nick. Uh, Pete Golding is your guys' uh, Broyles Award nominee. Uh, what stands out about the job that he's done this season for you guys? 
Yeah, you know, I think Pete has done a really, really good job. He's very bright. He, he, he uh, you know, articulates well with the players. He's a good teacher. I think he's a good motivator. I think the players respond well to him. And, um, you know, he's added some things that has helped us get better. I, I think, you know, he's done a very good job with the personnel that we have. And I, I'm just really appreciate the really good job that he's done. I think he's, you know, made really positive steps every year since he's been here. Uh, I love hiring younger guys like that and let them grow and develop, you know, in the organization. And, and he's certainly done a fantastic job of that. Got two more, Tony, and then Kurt. You've mentioned some of the young players making kind of more blue collar plays or some of the unheralded guys kind of making some of those blue collar plays. Is there a metric that you use to keep track of that? Or how do you go about evaluating the plays that kind of just don't show up on the stat book? I, I, I don't really. You know, I've been coaching a long time, so you have to define what a blue collar play is, you know, to me. I mean, offensive linemen, they got a blue collar play every down. Some positions more than others. Uh, some, some positions, every time you score a touchdown, you get accolades. Every time you throw a long touchdown pass, you get accolades. Um, Every time you get an interception, you get accolades. But, um, you know, people who are play on special teams, people who are core members of the team, who embrace their role, whatever it is, and they do it extremely well, uh, and they want to contribute in every way that they can, even though it may be a small way, they do it the right way. Uh, I think those guys are all blue-collar guys. That's the way I would define it, I guess. Thank you. Uh, Coach, um, we're all aware of the technique, I guess, of a defensive spy. And I wonder if, uh, uh, if that's something that's pretty common against your team with a mobile quarterback or if it's just, uh, just two, four quarterbacks and if there are pluses and minuses to the spy technique. I guess most teams have it in their book anyway. I don't really understand your question totally. So I'm going to rephrase it, and you tell me if I got it right. A running quarterback gives our defense more problems. Is that what you're saying? Well, I was really talking about it from the other end for the most part. Uh, a spy, what kind of an athlete does it take to spy, and is it usually on the quarterback, a mobile quarterback? And right. what are there pluses and minuses to using that technique? Well, I, I think when you – Obviously, you have a spy. You can rush three guys and have a spy. You can rush four guys and have a spy. That means you've got five guys committed to the rush, or you've got four guys committed to the rush. And, but the spy only works in passing situations. The spy only works when the quarterback drop back, drops back to pass, and then he takes off running. When it's actually a... Um, running play where the quarterback is a runner in the play, like an option or a zone quarterback pulls the ball and has a tight end, you know, leading in front of them. That's just like option football. That That's responsibility football. There is no spy for that. Somebody's responsible for the quarterback, and it could be different guys and different coverages, different, you know, defenses. But the spy only works. And we do – we've done a lot of spying. Um, you know, when we've been hurt by the, by, the, uh, by the quarterback run, like the 31 yard run at LSU, um, a guy made a mental error in the stunt that we were running, so we had a pass rush lane that was open with five guys rushing. So um, when you have five guys rushing, you want to push the pocket so the guy can't get out, uh, or you rush four and have a spy. So we rushed five, um, probably would have had a sack if we'd have done it the right way or we didn't do it the right way, and the guy ran for 31 yards. And that set up a score. So got to do a better job of teaching guys ash right and ash left.